Yeah, slight change in format this time around. I'm going to uh, kick things off, and, and sort of after a short while, it, it moves over to uh, uh, moves over to Stuart. So, a short summary um, for those that might eventually be catching up with this on on YouTube later. Uh, this is a, a four step project. We're now in step three. The first step was specifically, you know, how do you go about finding a place? What inspires you to you know, to choose a particular place over another? And that was looking very much at uh, maps. So all the various sites that we looked at that you can use that would enable you to, to find out about a place from a mapping perspective. In step two, we, we then moved on to essentially databases. So once you'd chosen your place, how can you then um, find out a little bit more about it? And again, we, we listed all the various databases that were probably the first places you would go to if you wanted to, in, if you wanted to do that. In, in this step, it's, it's a little bit more nebulous. We've called it sort of delving a little deeper. Um, it isn't necessarily all about the archaeology. It's, it's just what other resources exist to be able to give you some indication of you know, where your place is in the context of, of the landscape that it sits in. What, what is going on there? How can you investigate the, you know, the, the larger area, if you like, of, of what's there? And the information is... You know, from my own personal perspective, obviously, I'm learning through this as well. I mean, Stuart's been providing you know, pretty much all the resources, but I've been using them and, and I'm finding it quite interesting um, actually having a look around these resources because there's an awful lot of stuff I'm finding about around where I live, which I, I just simply wasn't aware were even there. You know, so from that point of view, it's it's actually quite useful. It may not actually be relevant to your to your place, but I think it just broadens the understanding of of you know, what's going on around you. And, and, and I think it's actually, um, you know, a nice little step. That this, this is probably one of the more interesting ones that I've, that I've, been, that I've been looking at. So, so what is delving a little deeper? Um, tried to split it down into, in, into four areas. One is specifically around the environment. We then move on to, to names and then more on, on the pictures, which is pictures taken from the air and pictures taken from the ground. And as ever, there will be a little resource pack which gives you some some URLs that you can you can look at to to go through this. Um, so let's kick off with with environment. Um, the the thing that always then everybody should look to is this this wonderful database called Magic. And and so I, I heard people talking. You know, have you used Magic? And I think, oh I, no, I, I'm not a member of the, the Magic Circle. You know what what is all this about? Um, and it's only when I got the the link that it started to make a little bit more sense and, and this I find is an absolutely fascinating resource where things that you just wouldn't have even thought existed can be found and, and, and I guess a little like some of the uh, the other resources we've looked at it can be somewhat overwhelming to, to, to sort of look through it so we don't intend in, in this session to give you specific instructions on how to use each of these resources. Um, they're the sort of resources you just take a look at and have a play with. And, and that's exactly what I've done with, with Magic. I've taken some time out and, and you will find that once you start using it, it becomes a little bit more intuitive um, you know, as to what you can specifically look for. So again, this is not gonna be an instructional, you know, click here, click there. This is the button you need to use. This tab is for this. It's just the resources here let's run through what it will provide and then basically you're you're on your own to uh, to, to go away and have a look at it now at this point some some technical jiggery pokery has to happen because this, this is a powerpoint and i'm now going to take my life in my hands and um share a new screen which is hopefully a desktop which you should see the same picture but this is now live on my web browser so hopefully you can uh, you can see that. So you can you see a, a yeah excellent yes yeah right so uh, that's the same page. Magic website provides authority to geographic information about the natural environment across. You know, it's provided from all sorts of government resources. If you click get started, you will end up on on this page, and like most of the resources you've seen so far, uh, there's a stream of menus here down the left hand side which initially look quite, you know, quite um, intimidating, especially when you break them all out and you can see what they do. But it's essentially a map which you can zoom in and out of. 
uh, and you can see against all of these categories what may or may not exist that's that's actually in there so you know you could for example if you were somewhere i don't know let's say around coventry you could center the map on coventry you could then start to zoom in and eventually you get a map uh, i've lost coventry some would argue perhaps not such a bad thing but anyway, there, we, there we there we go <laughs> not wishing to uh, <laughs> I have a lot of time for Coventry, I spent many years there, so that was very much uh, tongue firmly in cheek. So you then end up with this, with this map, and the further you drill down, the more detail the map becomes. These checkboxes here are, are what you get by default, and it defaults to the Ordnance Survey black and white mapping. And from a personal experience point of view, I fully understand why that's there now, because all of these are going to put overlays on this map of varying colours. And if you have an Ordnance Survey colour map overlaid with colour overlays, it starts to get a little intimidating. So again, whilst I said this is not an instruction on how to use it, one thing I found very useful is these are essentially transparency layers. So before I even start, what I actually used to do and still do is just back that off a little bit so you can still see the map but when the colors start appearing you can see where they are because when i first started using it I think, well it's not showing me anything um and it was because I, I i couldn't i couldn't see it so you can do it that way or you can put in a place name so i mean for example if i put in you know where i live at the minute it tells me oh thankfully i do exist and there i am and it will take you straight to the place. There's a, there's a small insert there of showing you the area that the map is covering in, in, in the sort of bigger area. And this is, is where it gets a little interesting because these take quite some time to, to load up. Um, so let me just turn that mapping up so you can see it really is Southport, you know, and I can, I can zoom out a little more. Um, and there we go. So you can pick your place either by zooming in or by, by choosing the place that you want. So regardless of that, now let's just start having a look down what, what is actually available. I'm sure if you're somebody like Stuart, a lot of these topics make perfect sense. But for, from my point of view, when I first started looking at it, it all seemed quite random as to what fit where, you know, what fitted in, into which place. And I just simply went through all of these individually to find out what was available. I would suggest you resist the temptation to click all of these boxes at the same time to see what's there. Otherwise you'll end up with a map which is completely incomprehensible. Um, so looking, looking at this, for example, you know, and I'm, I'm not gonna run through each one in turn, but just to give you a clue. So you, you have all the access routes, you have national trails, cycle paths, coastal path routes. These are particularly interesting where they can show you the, the, the green areas of, of where you may be countryside and rights of ways registered common land all that's useful stuff to know if you're if you if your place is, has got you know anything in, in relation to anything in relation to that and, and again you would just then say well you can see it breaks down even further you can either have all the national cycle networks or road ones traffic free tra i mean it's it's astonishing the level of detail that's that's in this place um so that's largely covered by by access and, and I'll, I'll give you a short summary later of the ones i think we would suggest that you use for now uh, administrative geographies if you're into politics and sort of local councils and all that sort of stuff this 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 is where you will have a field day um if you look at a lot of the government sites if you're particularly interested in saying seeing where covid is at the minute there's all these areas that are you know predefined there are political boundaries natural england forestry commission it's it again it, it's just bewildering how much you can actually see from these things but these are the organ organizational boundaries that exist within within the united kingdom uh, these are yeah well i'm not even going to run through those they don't even mean anything to me but i'm sure they mean something to to, to some people um and again it's it's maybe something for a a Sunday afternoon and a, and a large bottle of Chardonnay just to, to, to work through all these to see you know what may or may not be of interest so that's the administrative geographies I don't think that for me is too relevant for what we're doing but you know it's it's there now we start getting on to the, the interesting stuff you know country stewardship probably not too big a deal for, uh, for for what we're looking at but you can start to see some of these you know now make a little bit of sense so biodiversity um <laughs> 
Ramsar, I'm sure if you ask Stuart, he'd tell you exactly what that is. Um, I'm going to gloss over it neatly and sort of uh, avoid the rugby pass, as they say, or the hospital pass in rugby. But there are some things that I do understand. Sites of specific scientific interest, they're in there. Habitat, species, all of, all of those sorts of things. So, for example, you, know, you could click on habitat and, and under there you can start to see, well, goodness me, there's coastal, grassland, heathland. You know, woodlands, you, you name it, it's there. So I'm in a coastal area and I'll, and I'll demonstrate later. So, you know, a specific interest to me is coastal. I do happen to know that where I, where I live um, down here is a place called sort of Ainsdale and Formby. Around here, there's a reserve for um, the Natterjack toad. It's, it's, it often features there. It's a special area where you can't particularly do anything because you know the toad rules and and you'll find it you know if you look on there it'll tell you where the you know where it you know where it is uh, grasslands all of these individual ones that you can start to start to see are, are, are all featured the other one i think that's of particular interest um wetlands if, you, if you're into sort of bird watching and things like that you'll, you'll find all the the wetland areas uh, woodland, I think, is is quite interesting when we come to to our sort of places because you know that has a lot of history to it. And again, you can see all the different types of woodland that can be can be looked at. Um, and then, of course, <clears throat> you get down to the his historic environment, and lo and behold, you can start to see schedule management, schedule monument. I can't even say it. schedule management monuments. I'll get it right. Registered battlefields. You know, they're all there. To be able to see and if you click on these they start to pop up on the map um designations um i'm i'm going to sidestep that one i don't think that one's particularly interesting but you will find things in there that you know you, you would maybe want to look at this is a really good one habitats and species now you know you can see some of these are perhaps replicated up here but this is where it will tell you all the different habitats, saline lagoons, salt marsh, sand dunes. You know, for example, I know, for example, around here, there, there are an awful lot of sand dunes around the area. So if I was to click on sand dunes, all being well, it's, well obviously in time honored fashion, it's not going to do it for me now, but fortunately I have a blue Peter here's one I prepared earlier, but we can we can see later. But you'll see sand dunes starting to, to crop up down there. Um, just going a little bit further down. A lot of this is sort of farming related. So again, maybe not of too much interest to you where the countryside, countryside stewardships are, the envi our environmental stewardships with some of the other projects I'm involved with that, that actually is quite interesting. You can see, you know, which associated areas near to where you're working on have, have similar statuses, forestry and woodland schemes, landscape. Um, we can. I know this is going to get covered slightly later, but for example, if you wanted to know all the various geolo geological and soil types around you, you can find them out on, on this site. So I, I'm not going to sort of, well, I've virtually been through all of those, but you, it's something you have to have a play with yourself to see what you can see down there. But um, once, you've, once you've done all that, then you end up with something like this. And let me just make that maximum again. So here's, here's my Blue Peter slide. Um, I've been through all of those. This is, this is the area where I, where I live some, somewhere here. And I've clicked on some of those that you know, we, we mentioned where of interest. And, and what you can see is you end up with a pretty busy map of all the things that are going on. So here is the yellow sand dunes that I was talking about before. And, and that's now where this top bar comes into place. There's a lot of features here which are similar to other well-known online resources, Google Maps, where you can measure distances between the two. You can search for particular features. But the only one I'm going to pick out for now is this, this obviously the I button. Once you've clicked on the I button, you get a little crosshair and then you can zoom in to find out, well, what is it I'm looking, looking at? So, I mean, I'm, I have no idea what that one is, but it's, it's green. So I'm guessing it's something to do with woodlands or whatever. So let's click on that. And up pops the answer. It's a deciduous woodland area. And from there, you've got all the details associated with it, which you can then export or, or print out. So you can zoom in on a particular area and using this information button, just have a look around. Now, I'm not going to spend all morning going through this. I've, I've spent probably a good three or four hours looking through this, you know, over, over recent days just to see what's there. 
And I think what's fascinated me is the amount of information I found out that I simply didn't know, even in an area that's within two or three square miles of where I live. For example, where I've had, I used to play a lot of golf. I don't play much golf now, but the, the, the course where I play was absolutely riddled with um, schemes for looking after wildlife and, and things like that, where you know grants are given to be able to preserve environments for specific types of plants and, and wildlife. It's it's all it's all in this site. So. From that point of view, I, I personally find this site really interesting, and I suggest you just have a good look around. It may well be that at the end of all that, you've learned a lot about your area. Is it relevant to your, your project and my place in time? Maybe not, but I, I challenge you that there will be some things that you find out which, which would help you ultimately in, um, in understanding where we are. So that's the environment one, which is uh, all to do with the uh, the magic database. If I now go back to the PowerPoint, which I think is that one. So we should be back at a PowerPoint. I can now move on to, you said, there we are, names. Now, this, 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 this is a, a, a cracking little site, I have to say this. And again, it's, it's a complete revelation to me. Um, if you want to ask in, in the Q&A after, you know, the, the, the why it came to be where the source where the data source came from i'm sure Stuart will be able to explain at great length but in my limited understanding of what i see there was a lot of work done at some point to understand what was around in 1900 in in great britain and that data has been consolidated and was completed sometime around 2018 and all of that resource has been put online in this site called gb1900 it actually works off the national library of scotland but that's that's just a, as an aside really but what this allows you to do is search for a place name and i've yet to find a site that I can put in and, and not find a name of something because it's everything associated with what was around in 1900 um, I can put in little known place names here around Southport which only the locals know this will this will find it now again I'm not going to do a live demo on this we're just going to broadly run through you know what's available so you've got the main map which is where you put your name in and it will then drill down and you can see all of the, the things that you would you would want to do from there. And you end up with something that oh, gone too far should end up something like that. And it's all based around the, you know, the, 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 the maps of the time. You get colored dots, you know, being being indicated. And again, you can just click on them and it tells you all about them. There are an inordinate number of zoom levels you can get down to. <laughs> Um, so this this is very useful for seeing in 1900. Forward again, in 1900, what was available around the site that you uh, that, that you may or, or the place that you may have, have selected, and this is in the main dot distribution map. There's then three other categories which are again mo most interesting: quarries and collieries. I mean, I if you, if you if you look at the one for quarries and collieries. I spent a good hour looking through that. I had no idea of the amount of quarries and collieries there were in 1900, as, as opposed to say now. I know, you know we don't do as much mining for obvious reasons as we did back then, but there were even mines around here. You know, I always associated mining with, with Yorkshire, you know, down towards Witness Way, but even around here, the, the, there were a couple and there's an awful lot of quarrying that you can see too. Now, the only thing I would mention on, on this one is you can drill down into the map, but you don't get places that you can click on and see the information. Again, Stuart may be able to explain later, but it, it's as though it's picked up the word quarry or mine from a map and it references it that way. So you drill down to a you know, zoom level 14 or whatever it is, and then you will see the red dot becomes disused quarry and it'll give a, it'll give a name for it. And that's where the level of detail comes out for, for, from that point of view, but you will, you will see all of the, the, the quarries and, and, and mining sites that were around or at least noted in, in 1900. Um, and that in itself is, is, is quite, quite interesting to look at. You, know, you, you can see, you know, not surprisingly, you know, quarries are red, mines are blue. <laughs> so South Wales, no great surprise. Yorkshire, you know, it's the, the, these are the areas where all the, you know, the main mining used to take place. Uh, footpaths and uh, public buildings you, you can 
again use the site just like a lot of other things we've been through on, on the mapping site so far you can do it page at a time or you can do it side by side and on this particular example we've chosen you can see health services detailed side by side with where the religious religious buildings were you can you can look at the data pretty much any way that you you want to and drill down to see those sites that were available and again from my point of view it was interesting in southport to see you know buildings that i know now are used for you know certain you know whatever they are they could have been turned into flats or whatever in 1900 i could see that there was a convalescent hospital you know or, or something like that which I, I didn't necessarily know before so i i think the main focus of gb 1900 is again fantastic resource to go and have a look at but it's very very useful where you put in at the top you know, find a name you, you will almost certainly find it on on gb 1900 which um you, you might not on, on other sites. Um, that, I think, concludes uh, the first two topics. So at this point, I shall stop sharing and hand over to uh, my esteemed colleague, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. I've never been described as esteemed before. <laughs> um, no, I'll, I'll share my, my screen now with you, and, and uh, hopefully you'll see what I'm seeing at my end. Now, can you see my screen? Indeed. Good. That's a good start anyway. And if we can... Yeah, can you see the full? Yeah. The yes. full picture. Good. Right. Well, th thanks, Mark. That's, that's, that's given us a really good uh, feel of, of these broader data sets, which tell us something about wider environment. Th this, this second part, though, is, is slightly different because what I'd like to do now is explore the a couple of sites which tell us a lot about places, particularly in this uh, century, in the 20th century. And we're going to explore two, two sources of data, which some of you again may, may know about, some of you may have not encountered these before. And the first one of these um, sites I'm going to talk about shows as aerial photography taken in the early part of the 20th century between 19 about 1919 and 1958, I believe. And it's a collection of photographs taken not for archeological purposes. These were just general pictures of the landscape and things going on in the landscape. And that's what makes this, this session particularly different, I think, because we're looking at things which don't have, in essence, an archeological or heritage theme. And in many ways, like the slide on your screen at the moment, um, it's learning to look behind the obvious. What's going on in the background that might be a snapshot in time of a place you know or a place you want to know? And the first site we're going to look at is a site, uh, Britain from Above, which is the collection of aerofilms, uh, a company that took these commercial air photographs. And they're now curated in effect and made available through uh, Historic Scotland and um, English or Historic England as it is now and so on. It's a publicly available resource. And if you look, you'll see at the top, um, use my mouse, there are various categories about map galleries and groups. Well, map galleries and groups is probably the most interesting area for you to, to have a look at when you uh, get into this site, because it allows you to search areas from a map, which we'll look at shortly. It allows you to search areas by galleries of, of images that are put together and grouped by, by category. Um, and groups is rather interesting because when this project was being uh, put together, various groups got involved and decided to research things like a school might research what the landscape was like on the air photographs they could find for the, the area their school was in back in the 1920s and 30s and scout groups got involved in doing things canal groups and so on and they put lots of images into groups which i think is the sort of thing that that perhaps has resonance with with uh, yak in a way what can you what, what collective theme could you start to look at is it a place or is it actually a theme in its own right like schools in your town or or whatever it happens to be so, you get some idea of the, this site just from, from these four 
um, images on the screen where there are there are lots of images there which nobody's been able to identify and that can be quite fun in its own right. I, I defy you not to look at this site and then waste an entire evening, some might say, just browsing through loads of photographs because they're so interesting and you'd like to try and find out where they were. There's all sorts of images that were taken by the, these teams that flew about the country taking aerial photographs. Some of them never managed to be located, but lots of them have. And that's been partly due to, to groups sending out information saying, well, we recognize this photograph and, and putting it on the website. Also, you can see on, on the right hand side there that it covers the whole of, of Great Britain and many places abroad as well. You can see there that uh, there are 85,200 521 photographs of England. You can look down the list there and see how many photographs exist for different countries as well. So it's, it's an invaluable resource of the landscape in the early part of the 20th century. The map, you can search a map, you get some idea of that from the number of photographs that exist for different parts of the <coughs> country. And obviously you, you, you some areas have got more than others, but you can see the coverage of the whole of the, of the country and um, the Great Britain is uh, extensive, including extending out in, into places um, overseas as well. And you can search on that map and it will drill you down to a very local level where the flags are and you click on the flag and it gives you a picture and a date. That's Carlisle Castle, 1947. And it gives you an image of what Carlisle Castle and its environments looked like in 1947. You could start to compare that with, with Google Earth and see what's gone, for instance, and, and uh, build that into a project. It's an extremely easy site to use and it lets you see images as well of those places at whatever date the image was taken. It also allows you to look in more detail at some particular site, well, all the sites. In fact, all the images will, you, you can look at. It allows you to download them free of charge as well, if you want, uh, as long as they're for non-commercial purposes. And here's one, for instance, I, I selected from a place not too far away from me in, in North Wales, which is a place called Mendy Hall. And it shows evacuation camps that were created during World War II. Well, we've all, we all perhaps know about evacuation of children at the start of uh, World War II. But my, my, my understanding was most of the kids were, were taken off to uh, people's homes and, and distributed around in safe places. I wasn't particularly aware of evacuation camps were built. And in fact, 31 evacuation camps were built specifically to house children. It's like a, uh, like a university for, for, for the kids. To, um, they, they purpose built with canteens and, and blocks like Barrett blocks and so on. This particular one in North Wales, uh, in fact, is still an outdoor pursuit centre today. And over the years, since it was built in, in World War II, over uh, 345 children, 345,000 children have been through this camp in, in various guises, from evacuees to outdoor pursuits, and it's still going today. And it's fun to take a place like this uh, particularly that might have resonance for lots of children, older children that are now adults as well as younger children, and look at what still survives and compare modern Google imagery with the older imagery. That's just one example that I could use it. Here's another time stamping date, Heathrow Airport, 1946. It's a building site, effectively. And again, comparing that with the Google image of today might be quite fun for children to see which things have been built, which things have been built on, which things have gone. These are lovely timestamps for the early 20th century. And then of course you can take urban areas, which in effect just look like a, a clutter of streets, but we all know how much urban centers have changed now in places like Manchester, Leeds, Liverpool, Glasgow, and, and so on. They're almost hardly recognizable now. They're full of glass buildings and glass roofs and all sorts of things. And comparing streetscapes with earlier streetscapes, I think it's a fascinating area for particularly for children to, to learn how places change, how many, how many streets have shops in that don't have shops in now, for instance. The high street is a, is a good example of that and the, the crises around high streets. Places that used to be full of shops are now either boarded up or, or are all just coffee shops. How does streets change? 
not just over 20, 30, 40, or 100 years between different editions of maps. They even change over a decade. I can barely recognize some of the uh, shops in, in Chester, for instance, where I live, uh, um, with memories even five or six years ago. They change almost overnight. There all seem to be coffee shops these days, which is, uh, which is a bit uh, sad, but there we go. Not if you like coffee, of course, it's brilliant. Um, but you can also make things like this quite interesting. Here's a group who used Britain from above to create the Doctor Who challenge, adventures in, in time and space, which I, I rather like. They, they were fans of Doctor Who and they sought out locations where filming that took place and looked at what those places were like in the past and used images from this site to, to build up little notations about how it changed and, and what was there. The hiding place of Zygon's ship in the fourth Doctor story. I'm sure there's a, you know, it's great to, to link historical documentation like this, as it were, with, with, with places. Uh, and, and, and in a way, this is what this project is all about. It's not necessarily about understanding Stonehenge or your classic archaeological site. It's just that pro sowing the seeds of that process of looking finding information, relating that to maps, encouraging people to look in different places to go outside and explore. So in those seeds early, which is what, what you do as a group and what you do extremely well as a group in YAC, is helping sow those seeds for, for not just now, but for projects and for, and for children in the future. And uh, we, I thought we ought to throw this in at the last minute. It was Penny that alerted me this, uh, to this only the other night, that Historic England have uh, just released, I think it was this weekend, in fact, in the press release, um, all their projects that they've recorded archaeological landscapes from, from the air. Uh, and it's called something like Aerial Archaeology Mapping Explorer. And it, it gives you a transcription of uh, archaeological sites. I'm not going to say anything more about it. I haven't had a chance to explore it yet, but it was released this weekend. It's not the aerial imagery that they've put online. It's what they've transcribed of, uh, from the imagery of what they think are archaeological sites. So I won't, I won't dwell on that one, so I want to concentrate on the past and using past information. But I thought I'd throw that in there. Now, as well as the, the old photographs from the Britain above site, which I think there are something like 95,000 photographs that you, you can browse. Again, you can get lost in, in looking at images of your, your town, and your your village, the bits of countryside, and so there are just thousands of photographs to look at. What I want to look at now is places, or pictures of places taken from the ground, because as we know from the sorts of information sets I'm sure you've all used before, like historic postcards and so on, and photographs of family, and historic photographs you see from museum collections, collections that we pointed to in, in even in the heritage databases like Cough Line for Wales, Canmore for Scotland and the Historic England site. There are lots of images that relate to archaeological sites as, as well as general streetscapes and so on in postcards. But this particular site I, I, I'd like you to, if you've got time, to have a look at. So I think it's particularly interesting in terms of stimulating ideas. Is one called Time Peaks. And all the, um, the links to these we'll, we'll send out in the, the, the pack later on, don't worry about trying to note down what, what they are at the moment. And if you see the two uh, pictures at the top, which are labelled 45,827 Greater Manchester Post-War Photos, and the one on the right, 114 photographs of Attercliffe and Sheffield, these are the ones I want to concentrate on this second session, and you'll, you'll see why when I go through them, because although these were a collection put together, particularly for Greater Manchester, what they illustrate applies to almost anywhere in the country in terms of stimulating ideas, and, and I'll explain a little bit more later on about that. Now, um, th that particular site, is also linked through the Ordnance Survey because it has special resonance with the mapping elements of our project and, and the Ordnance Survey in that the photographs in those, those two collections that uh, I spoke about are 
In effect, an archive of Ordnance Survey photographs were taken, which were taken immediately after World War II. And those photographs were taken almost in every street, in every town in the country. And it is an incredible, or shape, I should say it is, I should say it was, and I'll explain a bit more about that shortly. It was the most incredible photograph of every street taken during that period. And the photographs were compiled in, into albums as records of points for um, survey control in the mapping process. If you look in the bottom left hand corner, you see a man with an arrow and a, a board saying November, no, November 53, November 1953, 63B, and he's got an arrow pointing at a house corner. This is a photographic record of these points that the Ordnance Survey were using to, to create the maps. Why the man is at the lamppost is a totally different question. I suspect he's mending a gas lamp, but we'll, we'll move on to that shortly. Now, this site, Typex, also locates where all these photographs are taken. And the Greater Manchester area is an example, I think, from here, I think, and I think this is where this is taken from. Um, but you can search, like all the other sites we've looked at, it, this will tell you roughly the density of photographs in that particular bit of that urban area. So you can search it by, by a map. And you can also search it by uh, name and various other things as well. It's very, very easy to use. And this gives you an idea of, of the flavour of it. There's the man pointing at that particular corner. It's got the information on about which street it is. It's a corner of number 31 Pollard Street, junction of, of Bond, I think Boone Street, probably should have been Bond Street and Pollard Street. It gives you a location. And in the top right hand corner, it tells you which KM it's in, and it's in um, KM 33, which you can translate to letters from the Ordnance Survey 8598. You can look that up on one of the Ordnance Survey map sites and find out which kilometre square that is. But the point is about this, look, look at that photograph taken at that timestamp on in the, the 10th month of 1946, it tells in bottom corner. Look at the buildings in the background. You can see all sorts. It's a streetscape, hardly any cars, cobbled streets. That's what it looks like now. There's a photograph of a man in one of the projects involved with it, with Time Picks, who, who's been out and relocated all those places. How much a street can change in time is a fascinating topic for, I think, stimulating. Um, thoughts and ideas about children in places they live, particularly in urban areas. This process can apply almost anywhere. How much has something changed using photographs and images like this, stimulating those ideas to go and explore using maps and photographs. Here's another photograph. And I'm pointing at something in the foreground. Totally different. How much an environment can change over a relatively short space of time. And then we, we move into what images are of oh, the, these photographs were taken specifically uh, to record the point. What was in the background was almost irrelevant, apart from giving it a general location. I'm sure some of you will know what type of buildings those are. They're prefabs, prefabricated buildings which were erected after World War II to, to house people who were uh, dislocated from, from their environment due to bombing and relocation and, and so on. But in the right hand corner, you can also see what looks like the remains of an Anderson shelter surviving above ground. Anybody doing projects related to wartime and post war Britain? This hardly any prefabs exist anymore. And what examples there are, uh, many now have been, have been listed in their heritage assets. Can you find areas in your uh, town or area where prefabs once existed, for instance? Sometimes it's just simply about people. Some nice photographs of people, which make the photographs interesting. But one of my particular favourites, which this illustrates, is gateposts. How much of gateposts? Have a look along any urban street and look at the variety of gateposts that you can find. Have they always been there? Do they look right? Those, those two gateposts certainly don't look, look right to me. They've been taken from somewhere else. Look at the, the socket holes on the, on the front of it and on the side. They've been brought from somewhere else and relocated to that spot. And I bet if you walked along that street, there'd be, there'd be dozens of reused gate posts from other houses. 
that is something you can still do today. And, and I've done it with, with uh, one group anyway in, in one area, which is looking at different types of gateposts. It's great for observation. Take a simple photograph, make a simple record. Some of the things children can, can easily do, and then you can do a bit of res research in, to find out perhaps where they might have come from. Look at shops. What sort of things in a, in a shop? There's a, that says on the blind, it's a draper's shop. I think it's Fairhurst, I think it is. On the right-hand side, are, um, I'm not sure what they are. They look like aprons and, and um, things like that. And then the left-hand side, it looks like a display of cornflakes. I'm sure it's a display of cornflakes. But how the shop fronts have changed over the years. These, in that particular time fix album, which you know, there, there are some 45,000 photographs you can look at of all the streets in, in Greater Manchester, which is a huge area. You can, it's an amazing collection of what used to be in shop fronts. Are there any shop fronts in your area that you can look at and see how they might have changed and, and what their use is today, for instance? Things like styles of front doors. Even simple things like that make interesting projects for encouraging uh, and developing that visual memory that is the foundation of what makes us, I think, interested in, in archaeology and, and past. It's not just information, it's being able to go and see it and look at it and try and visualise what it was like in the past. Looking at things like this helps, helps those foundations build for children to, uh, to, to take with them into the future, um, either in heritage or in just in general way they view their environment and, and learn to value it and, and understand it. The background in, in simple shots like this is an advertisement there for a communist candidate for, well, I think, vote for Sheila Waring. I wonder what happened to, to her. But there's a man in the background with a different shop front, different signposts there and so on. There's all sorts of ways you can, you can look at a photograph and find something in there that you might be able to pull out that you might potentially be able to use in the project. This one here, um, what fascinated me was the telephone behind the man with the arrow. Look at the, look at the elaboration. Is that a kiosk or is it a phone box? Interesting style. I don't think I've seen one like that before. What phone boxes survive in the areas that you run your projects, are they all alike? Uh, are they all alike? Are there any still still surviving, for instance, now? Very few red uh, post boxes, uh, telephone boxes about these days. Where were they located? Can you find them on maps? These are all simple questions and simple projects that can stimulate ideas. And, and children can also look at these photographs and see what else they can find on them. You can make it like a what can I spot in a photograph if you look at this, this particular resource? Why are the white bands around the bottom of the, the lamppost there? Well, of course, you will know that so uh, the cars didn't uh, drive into them and people didn't walk into them during the blackout. They were meant to stand out so they didn't bump into things or drive into them. Things like that, which are residues of um, streetscapes from, from the wartime. Lampposts. I love lampposts as well as, as well as gateposts. Lampposts. How many different lamppost styles are there? If you walk around uh, town centres, sometimes you find some of the old gas lamps still survive. They've almost been forgotten. And some of them, obviously, they're not working anymore. But looking at different ways you've got of street furniture developing from something like this, where gas lamps were an, an, an important social change in the social landscape, as it were, not as well as a physical landscape, what do they look like today? How many different styles are there in the area? There's different ways of, of looking at it. You can probably gather, I get really excited about these sorts of us. <laughs> well, because I used to work for the Ordnance Survey and actually use these albums in anger, believe it or not. I actually used them to relocate places when I was a surveyor with the Ordnance Survey. And I used to spend many a lunch hour, I'm digressing here, but I used to spend many a lunch hour just sitting, looking through the photographs and thinking, this is fantastic. You know, the, records of all these streetscapes all, all over the country. But when the uh, digital age came in, um, back in the 80s, and all of a it went into dig digital mapping and then GPS surveying came in, where satellites were used rather than, than theodolites, um, all these albums were destroyed. Believe it or not, physically they were skipped and burnt. The Ordnance Survey didn't want them, nobody else wanted them. There were far too many of them for records officers to archive and they didn't want them. 
Fortunately, one or two collections survive. The Greater Manchester one is by far, by far the biggest one. Odd ones survive in some local records offices, so it's worth checking to find out if they survive for your area. Unfortunately, through a, through a, I think it's a Heritage Lottery grant, this particular collection of 40 odd thousand from Manchester was, was, was put online and, and made available. It's a great shame, one of the major photographic records of the um, immediate post-war period was destroyed in, in, in that call of these albums. Anyway, I digress. Back to one of my favourites, gateposts. Look at those two gateposts there. They're, they're, they're very different, aren't they? Those two gateposts have clearly come from two different places. Collecting gateposts must have been a, uh, a bit of a hobby in this part of, of Greater Manchester, I think. It's just another illustration of what things can be interested in a local place if you start looking for them. And things like this, just looking at the, the clothing that children wore and the, the interest that people showed in, in places. When this man suddenly turns up with an arrow and starts at pointing at things, of course, it attracts lots of people interest. And there are thousands of photographs where people in all different styles of dress in the immediate post war Many people still walking about with uniforms on and, and so on, where you can, you can relate what people are wearing to a point in time. And if, you're, if you want little projects, you can take a little area you can identify from the map and area and look at what the, the streetscapes might be like in, in that area and what people were wearing, tie, tie people to, to places. And I'm, I'm going to sort of end on how somebody has used those photographs to create their own little storybook um, on that site. Uh, um, a lady created her, her own story based on some photographs which were in that album, which were taken in, in May 1953, which I think is a good example of how something like this is used. It, it just happens again. The photograph was taken because the man was pointing to a particular point on that, that gate stone, which was to be used for a survey point. That was all the Ordnance Survey were interested in. What was on in the background was irrelevant, but of course, apart from the no bookmakers, which I like, um, is that one that says, obviously, police notice danger, smallpox, keep out. Why was that? 1953, smallpox outbreak. Um, we're in Todmorden. Um, and I need a Leno in, uh, wrote this little story and put it on this website and it gives you a little idea of, of how one photograph can stimulate a bit of research into a place, which makes this um, image interesting and it's a very easy little project to, to put together. Now, Todd Madden is on the Yorkshire Lancashire boundary. She, I'm not, what I'm not going to do, I'm not going to tell you the full story because I think it's worth looking at yourself and reading it. Um, because she, she will tell it far better than I did. But it's just simple narrative on one side of the screen, map on the right hand side of the screen, gives you a little bit of a snapshot in time of the afternoon of the Thursday, 12th of March, 1953, when a, um, a medical officer got a phone call from Halifax General Infirmary saying, I think we might have a case of smallpox. There hadn't been a case of smallpox uh, in, in that part of the world for 15 years, and certainly hadn't been a death from smallpox since the, the 1860s in that part of the world. So if an outbreak of smallpox was, was, was big news, obviously, um, and this one phone call set this in motion. The man who had it was a mill worker, and he was transferred to, believe it or not, Ainsworth Smallpox Hospital. And I couldn't resist that one because who, with my name, who couldn't resist the story that has Ainsworth in it? And that is pure coincidence. I, I didn't search out Ainsworth and find a story with it. I just came across this on the Time Pick site and thought, wow, there's a coincidence. And I do love serendipity. But you can see on that map, there is Ainsworth Hospital, infectious diseases. And what the Elaine Owen has done is put together a little story and tells you about that smallpox outbreak. And you can see in there from uh, a map that was produced of the patients in the ward where that particular patient was kept. You can see there's a record there of which patients were infected with 
smallpox and the dot density map, which I'd, I'd rather like. Unfortunately, like we're in a time of pandemic and pandemic stories, uh, I find particularly interesting. And um, here we have a, a story of the spray from this one particular mill worker. Now at the time, you see she's using the photographs that were taken from, the, from that particular album for Greater Manchester. It was thought that the outbreak was spread by handling bales of raw cotton, which you see there's a photograph which shows bale, bales of raw cotton in a mill uh, in Greater Manchester. Of course, uh, that it, the story is much more complicated than that. It is an airborne virus and, and it was spread by people, not by bales of raw cotton. But nevertheless, at the time when they didn't quite understand it, this it was thought of how it was spread by people handling bales of raw cotton. But it didn't just stay in the local area, it spread. It spread out to Alden and it spread out to Leeds eventually. And it was thought to have been spread by bales of cotton being moved on lorries. And there's a photograph of a lorry at a the style of lorry at a mill. And uh, it was thought it was being spread by you know, people handling the, the bales and touching the doors of the lorries and so on. In fact, of course, it was just spread by probably by the lorry drivers and people who were meeting the lorry drivers and so on. And we understand more about that now, but less was understood about it then. That's the mill where the man worked, Mom's Mill. There's a photograph taken from Britain Bush showing the scale of the mill at that particular time. And of course, you can look now uh, on Google Earth, and the mill is uh, sorry, the, the isolation hospital that the infected were taken to is there and it's still, still isolated, although it's no longer an isolation hospital. And it's now, I believe, I think there's a planning application actually to convert into, into housing. It carried on as a nursing home um, into the 60s and 70s, but it's still effectively, it sits in isolation in that particular landscape. Now, it's an interesting story. I haven't, I haven't got time. I didn't want to give you all the details. I think Elaine got a, a nice little story around that and using some of the resources that I've pointed to you, the, 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 the way she's done it. Um, six people died in that particular outbreak and, and about 40 people were, were infected, I believe, and, and it was contained through the isolation process and, and uh, lots of people were vaccinated and disappeared and the, 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 the thing disappeared from that particular part of the world, fortunately. It's a nice little illustration of how, how things can, can be brought together. There's a modern Google image of it. It's now um, housing, and I believe you we'll say more, more housing is going to be built on there in due course. The dot density map gives you some idea of the spread of it. Started at number one and spread to a number of locations, probably through the, the lorry drivers. Um, what's an interesting story that Elaine puts in there about the lorry drivers is that the majority were were ex-servicemen when they, when they investigated uh, why this disease might have spread. And most of them were wartime soldiers and had, had received smallpox vaccinations because they were not intended to serve overseas. Um, well, of course, they, because they'd been vaccinated, many of them were carrying it, but didn't know they got, didn't know they got smallpox. Some of them just had sniffles or it had high temperatures for a couple of days, but didn't give it much thought. Uh, and that's probably why the disease spread, because um, they, they really didn't know they were spreading it at the, at the time. So that's a, a, a quick a quick sort of use of some of those historic aerial photographs and ground photographs and some ideas of how you might um, stimulate ideas in, in the children that, that you work with. And so they, the links are, will be on the, the pack that we sent to you. And um, if you're anything like me, you'll probably find yourself just getting absorbed in, in that story and looking at some of those photographs in, in those albums and, and enjoy it because it's, it's good fun doing things like this. It's enjoying places at a point in time.